Thanks for coming, everybody. Um, I, I was hoping to get the chance to um, uh, put together a presentation that will, would focus more on the gallery-related art um, that I've uh, created over the years, but because I'm uh, busy painting a mural um, in Honolulu, um, uh, uh, I'm going to have to give you the same presentation I gave the university. I gave at the university, but I don't see anyone from that audience here, so this works out perfectly. <laughs> um, so, there's an elephant in every room. What does that mean? That we, we're all, of course, um, or not of course, we're all maybe um, familiar with the term, uh, uh, the elephant in the room. So, so, so I th the, the, the notion that there's an elephant in every room, I, I think is a, um, kind of an accidental starting point uh, for a lot of the projects um, that I do. Um, speaking of starting points, a very major one was in 2011 um, in Tahrir Square in Egypt, where basically um, a revolution happened. So, that's me. You can't really see what I did, but apparently what I wrote on the back of that billboard got people really excited. Um, and, um, but the interesting thing is like, I didn't really invent anything. I didn't write anything that they, uh, not only that they didn't already know, but what they weren't already saying. They were already chanting uh, things. They were chanting down with Mubarak, down with the regime. Um, and if you weren't chanting it, you could definitely hear it because it was echoing throughout the whole, um, you know, uh, square uh, and throughout downtown Cairo, really. Um, so I just basically climbed the billboard and, and, and spray painted it and, and didn't really do a good job at it. You can't really even see it. Um, but it was enough for people to get so excited about it. And, and, and that got me thinking about 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 doing something, this idea of, of doing something that people already know, um, but but it, it's not it's not really said enough, or it's not said in the open. But but something that you've known for so long that isn't really talked about, and and how how relevant it is, how relevant it is to see it openly talked about, and how seeing it visually rep represented. Of course, uh, I don't think. Every uh, you know work of, of uh, a relevant work of art necessarily has to be met with such enthusiasm <laughs> or positivity. Um, here's an example of something met very negatively. Um, to um, I guess to explain why it was met so negatively, let's look at it before uh, this act of uh, civilian censorship. So this is what it looked like. Um, basically what we have here, we have four figures. In the center we have our uh, ex-dictator, uh, uh, Hosni Mubarak. And, and, and he's surrounded by basically you know, his, uh, his cronies, some of his cronies, his posse, right? Um, when they announced that Mubarak would get a fair trial, which we know now was not fair at all, but when they did announce that he would get a fair trial, um, they also, you know, uh, uh, handpicked a couple of his uh, key, f like key figures from his regime, um, also to stand trial. Uh, these guys, however, were not, um, were not any, were not one of those figures. But they, they um, were not included. They did not stand trial. They were, uh, uh, but but they were major figures in his regime. Um, and this was in March two thousand eleven. Only a few days. Um, or, um, or you know, less than a month after they announced uh, the fall of Mubarak, um, and people had had believed that the revolution had succeeded. Um, so, um, so, 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 painting these figures um, who were not brought to trial with Mubarak seemed like um, an important thing to um, to me anyway. Important thing to point out. 
Um, and, and apparently some people did not want that pointed out, you know, which meant I was probably doing the right thing. Another piece um, that was not met so um, enthusiastically is this one. This is a sticker um, that I was putting around town uh, with the help of uh, some friends. Um, as you can see here, uh, uh, the act of the censorship is focused on the text more so than the image. So let's examine this text together. So it reads, <clears throat> New, the Mask of Freedom, a salute from the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces to the loving sons of the nation, now available for an unlimited period of time. Um, so it's kind of like a mock advertisement, advertising this quote unquote Mask of Freedom. Um, this was also immediately after the, 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 this whole revolution stuff and the announcement of the fall of Mubarak. And, and basically, there was kind of this sense of this propagated freedom that wasn't necessarily very real, where you know they had, um, uh, uh, there were a couple of referendums, and people went and voted, and you had like nationalistic music on television, and the flag waving, and all that stuff. While, but, but meanwhile, if people would go out and protest, they would get um, arrested and uh, they would stand trial, uh, you know, military trials, and people were arrested in mass numbers uh, in the months following the, um, the, the fall of Mubarak. So, <clears throat> so this idea of having, having this mask that, um, that, that makes you unfree, that does not allow you to see, does, does not allow you to speak, um, but has these kind of decorative wings, these wings that can't really function, they don't really allow you to fly, but they're just like there for show. Um, but the actual function of the mask in reality is to obscure your, your vision and gag your mouth, right? So, um, actu so in, in putting up the, the, the stickers around town, um, some people did not like it um, and they weren't really ready for it. Um, and it, it caused a bit of a fuss um, on the street, some people uh, gathered around, called us spies, uh, called us traitors, and it, it you know turned into a really big argument, really big commotion. So that attracted the attention of military police at the time. There was no normal police because we had kind of burnt down all the police stations. Um, so, so military police had taken over, and military police arrived and they detained us. And I did what any, um, I guess, anyone with some knowledge of social media would do, and I just tweeted about it, that I was getting detained. Um, and what was amazing sort of was the response that happened afterwards. Um, so on, uh, on Facebook and Twitter, people started, this image was already, I had it online already, available for download, anybody could, could use it for whatever they wanted. So people found the image and they started using it for their avatars. And it really spread um, while I was still in the police truck. Um, and and, a, and a, a hashtag, a free Genzir hashtag showed up and was used even though I wasn't really in prison. I was still in the car. Um, so this happened very fast. And, and then the activist community in Cairo actually mobilized so fast that by the time I reached the military base where I would have stood had to stand a military trial and get convicted within half an hour. Um, there was actually a huge protest waiting for us with the image printed. Um, and I guess the, 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 the higher up guys, they, you know, they were like, well, let's just let him go. You know, it's no big deal. It's just a sticker. The guy actually who was questioning me, he was like, I, <laughs> I had like maybe five stickers on me. So he took three, put them in an envelope, and then he took two, put them in his pocket, I think because he liked it so much. <laughs> um, also on that same day, so I, we, were, we were released that same evening. Um, so speedy release, I would, I would uh, 
credit this kind of the activist community and the mobilization for it. Um, and, and it was also talked about on, on television, uh, on, on a popular talk show that same evening. Um, I don't know why they stretch images on television. I wish they would stop doing that. Um, and, and basically, uh, so the next, the next day there was a big protest planned in the square, and also the image was quite prominent in the square. Uh, where people had, 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 had used it as you know, banners and posters and that sort of thing. Um, this guy, I, I remember I was taking a picture of him, <clears throat> and he was like, do you know about this? I was like, no, man, I'm just taking a picture. I don't know what this is about. Um, so he was like, yeah, man, some guy yesterday, he was putting these posters up around town, and the military arrested him. I was like, really? That's like, that's totally uncool. He was like, I know. And he was like, I had no problem with the military up until this point. But then after I heard about this, I decided we have to bring the military down. I was like, all right. Um, I also saw the image um, on t-shirts in the square. Um, different versions of t-shirts in the square. Um, I would and it was like sold in the square. I would also later see the t-shirt kind of used in big protests. Uh, this one was in front of the Ministry of Interiors, um, like police headquarters basically, where you can't really protest now anymore. It's really hard. Oh, right. So this image would later, in the year 2015, become an inspiration for a work that is now showing at Leila Heller Gallery in New York City. This is the great American mask of freedom, because everything in America is great, of course. We can talk about this later if you like. Um, all right, back to Egypt, 2011. Um, around May, um, with the help of volunteers, I had uh, p 20 volunteers, a bunch of us, we had painted this very large mural. This was the largest at the time. It's a life-size tank facing off with a guy on a bicycle and a panda. Now, to understand the s symbolism behind these images, of course, tank is the military. Um, the guy on the bicycle is, is, uh, is uh, someone you would see every morning in Cairo. He is the bread biker, and he is uh, the guy who delivers uh, bread. He's carrying a huge tray of bread on his head. There's bread from the bakeries in the morning, fresh bread, to the retailers, so everyone can buy fresh bread. Um, and, and, and the word bread, Aish, um, all in, in, in Egyptian Arabic also means life, and, and, and um, you know, bread is just seen as a livelihood of the everyday Egyptian. So having a, uh, a tank face off with, you know, the bread guy is sort of kind of very, very obviously saying that these two are at odds with each other. Um, now the panda, I had nothing to do with. The panda is by an artist who goes by the name of Sad Panda. And he likes to draw sad pandas on, on the street. Of <laughs> um, but what's really interesting about sad panda is, is where he places the panda. So very often, he, he, would, he, would, he would place the panda in a, in a place where the panda would be looking at something that is heartbreaking. So the panda is sad about something. And that's sort of his way of saying, things that bother him, I guess, as a person. So in this case, the panda's looking at this tragic scene of, I guess, the tank about to run over the bread guy. Um, now this, this mural was a result of, this was one mural uh, created over uh, the course of a weekend. Um, it was called Mad Graffiti Week. This is sort of a poster I had designed to, um, to gather volunteers and gather other street artists to also create work targeting the military apparatus in the country uh, over the course of that same weekend. Um, and it was kind of one of the first efforts to consolidate all of, all of you know, our, our skill sets together. Um, and this poster 
would also later become the inspiration for this poster, uh, for the movie Art War by Marco Wilms, um, that, you know, um, it, basically Marco, he spent like maybe three years on and off uh, in Egypt um, following street artists around and kind of documenting what was happening. So, this is the flag of Switzerland. Why am I showing the flag of Switzerland? Well, I also want to demonstrate that you don't necessarily need a crisis as, obviously as the Egyptian crisis, to create you know, what I feel is, is art relevant to people outside of the standard art bubble. Um, in Switzerland, I was invited to participate in Art Basel, um, uh, theater Art Basel, and I need to find a problem. I need to find a problem to to, to make work about, and it's a theater festival, but so I wanted to do something that's had some kind of performative aspect to it. Of course, typically, when I'm invited to do some work in some country, it's expected that I'm gonna do something about Egypt, so of course I don't. Um, um, so I need to do something about Switzerland. Um, and I found this great quote that says, uh, this, it's about from the State Secretary of Economic Affairs of Switzerland, who said, we exercised restraint for export of war material to countries in North Africa and the Middle East, notably Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, and Egypt. Um, which is cool by me. I don't want no Swiss weapons in my country. But um, the notion of um, Switzerland as an arms exporter I found interesting. You don't really think of Switzerland as a place that exports arms. We think of Switzerland as maybe chocolate, right? Swiss chocolate. And, you know, um, democracy and all kinds of wonderful things. Um, so I, I, I looked into uh, the uh, arms exports of uh, Switzerland. <clears throat> and I found that um, Swiss small arms and ammunition exports amounted to $191 million in 2011 alone, ahead of Israel, Russia, and South Korea. So some pretty heavy players there, right? So, you know, Switzerland is big in the arms industry, apparently. Um, small arms in, in particular, because I guess small arms, um, you know, are, have some kind of precision aspect or something in Swiss watches, right? I don't know. Um, so, so I looked into uh, who, who the biggest importers of these Swiss arms are. And, of course, at the top of the list is the United States of America. So, what did I do? I, I painted the quote. We had it, we, as you can see here, there's um, a large, this is, this is shot from above. You can see little people. So this was painted in a courtyard where the festival took place. Um, and if you were uh, a visitor of the festival, you would be in one of the buildings around the courtyard, um, possibly on the second or third floor. So you would be able to see this um, painting from above as we are looking at it now. Um, so I painted the quote. And here we have a bunch of dead bodies, uh, basically the visitors to the festival. They were uh, the volunteers. They would play dead uh, to have these outlines illustrated. And the white, the white signifies the number of deaths during the Egyptian Revolution up until that point in time, that was sometime 2012. So almost a year into the revolution. And the yellow signifies the number of deaths by gunshot in the United States during the year 2010 alone. So it's a like one to eight ratio. So I asked people, because the Swiss like to vote, right? Should Switzerland ban arms exports to the United States? <clears throat> um, another wonderful European country that I did some work in. Um, basically, we see this painting here. Uh, we see a child soldier with an amputated hand um, holding an outline of some sort of machine gun. Now, this is not exactly what the piece looked like originally. 
it also saw the same kind of um, citizen censorship that some of the work I do in, in Egypt um, sees. Here's what it originally uh, looked like. So we have a, a machine gun made out of Euro bills. This was painted in Frankfurt, the banking capital of Europe. And of course, it's a it's commentary on how all these guns that make their way into the hands of child soldiers in Africa are not really African weapons, right? They're, they mostly come from Europe, and it's big business to um, Europeans arm, manu uh, arms manufacturers. And uh, of course, the, uh, whoop, the Germans didn't like it. So uh, oh, oh, also, uh, you'll notice that the belt um, the belt of the kit is actually uh, made out of um, actual Euro coins, which are still entirely intact. So the real money is still there, but the fake money is gone because the fake money is where the elephant in the room is. Um, I was invited to Bahrain to paint in this public art festival. Um, and um, well, they gave me this really big building, said so you could paint whatever you want on it, but stay away from the royal family. So I had to paint something that had to do with the royal family. Um, so it was a question of how to get away with that. What exactly can you do? Because this is, you know, it's a, it's a festival. It's it's partially funded by the uh, the, the, the Bahraini Ministry of Cult Culture. And it's a, it's, a, it's a big building with, with, with high visibility. How do you get away with it? What do you do? Um, so here's what I ended up painting. What we have here. Uh, let's go through this. Basically, so the figure. This, this bird-like figure, basically I got inspired by, I went to the museum, uh, the National Museum in Bahrain, and I discovered that um, there are uh, traces of an ancient civilization in Bahrain, which I did not know about. Um, and, and you don't really see much, um, a much visual representation of that ancient culture in contemporary Bahrain. Um, unlike Egypt, where you, know, you still see a lot of ancient Egyptian stuff, there's, you could, you know, culturally speaking, there is some kind of lineage there, it's not totally detached. Um, so I, I felt it would be interesting to use one of these, create that kind of lineage in a, a, a visual representation um, by bringing some of something from that ancient culture there. So I used one of these bird figures and basically um, dressed it up in, the, in, in, in these, what is contemporary kind of Bahraini traditional clothes. Um, not any clothes, though. Uh, uh, this, this, this robe, this particular robe, is a royal robe. It is only to be worn by royalty. Um, and, and we have the gold bits. The gold bits of the robe, basically, there's usually a geometric pattern that goes there. Um, and I replace that pattern with um, folkloric, um, like folkloric representations, for folkloric art from the many minority cultures in Bahrain. Now these minority cultures, um, a lot of immigrants, only Im uh, actually immigrants, the, all, of, all of the the service industry and all the workers and I know drivers, chefs, you name it, like everyone working in Bahrain actually is not, is, is not really from Bahrain. They're, they're mostly immigrants from, um, you know, um, India, Bangladesh, um, Thailand, uh, the Philippines. So, um, and, and they're also not really visually represented in Bahrain, although they are, you know, they are quite dominant there. They're, you know, the kingdom is kind of built on their backs. So, so by having uh, 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 some visuals from their cultures in the royal robe, I felt as a way of kind of making that statement um, that they are as much a part of the kingdom as uh, anybody else. Um, 
this is the result. Um, and um, nobody complained. So I kind of got away with it. Um, but actually, I did notice that during, as I was painting, this was kind of, this, this neighborhood is an upscale uh, neighborhood in Bahrain. There are a lot of restaurants and cafes in the neighborhood, so a lot of uh, immigrants working in these restaurants. Everyone working there, chefs and waiters and delivery guys, they're all you know, immigrants, and they're the ones who got it. And they would like often, as I was painting, clap or whistle. And so I was like, cool. Um, let's see. OK, back to Cairo. Um, so this is um, to demonstrate also that it doesn't have to be you know, what's traditionally known as street art, I guess, to do something that I feel kind of speaks to a, a broad uh, audience outside of the typical art sphere. Here, this is an installation I did in Cairo with uh, my friend Yasmin Layat, who's a technologist. So what we did was we took over a, uh, an abandoned uh, shop in downtown Cairo. Uh, we got in touch with the owners who weren't using the shop and we asked them if we could borrow it for a month. Um, they said, cool. Um, and basically we set up this installation there for a month where every day uh, a new face would show up on, on, the, on the shop's window. Now, where's this one? Never mind. Oh, man. All right. So there would be a new face that would show up on... On, on, on the window uh, of the shop, and, um, and, and the eyes basically would just follow people walking down the street, and it would signify something else um, depending on who, 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 who you're being watched by, right? Um, so in that first video, that was um, Khalid Said, who uh, was brutally uh, beaten by police in Alexandria uh, till he died. And, and he was kind of a figure for the uprising in 2011. Um, and there'd be different faces. One face would be like um, a watchdog um, in, in a police uniform, for example, watching people down the street, which would mean something else. Uh, and, 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 and uh, you know, there, were, there was also, I think, the Ministry of, uh, media or information or something who in a couple of inter interviews had like made some um uh let's say dirty comments to who the lady interviewing him um so there was him kind of watching people with some drool down his uh, mouth and you know so it would it depend on who, who's watching you it would mean something else right um Another project I did, this was in July uh, 2011. This was with the help of some friends. And uh, there was a big, there was a, there was a big um, sit-in planned for the square. At the time, public opinion about the people who go to the square was kind of negative, thanks to the media, local media in Egypt at the time, who, who had accused these, these square people of um, not knowing what they want, of... Uh, of just being, you know, having too much time on their hands, being homeless, being whatever, and, and not really unable to figure out what they want or what they're protesting about. So not so similar from the whole Occupy movement, I guess, in, 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 in the States. Um, so we put together, I figured, I figured a good way to figure out whether they could really agree on some stuff or not would be by putting together a questionnaire. So we did what the government should actually be doing. We put together this questionnaire um, and um, we printed 20,000 copies. 
and we set up kind of like these little distribution points around the square and collection points, and we ended up collecting 10,000 copies uh, of the filled out forms. And here are some of the results of some of the questions. So, should parliament members consult the people they represent before making decisions? 90% said yes, 10% said no. I don't know why they would say no, but. Should governors be elected or appointed? 90% said elected, 10% said appointed. Up until this day, um, governors in Egypt are appointed by the president. Who should be responsible for drafting laws and regulations? 50% said the people, 40% judiciary, 6% the government, 4% the military. Should serving in central security forces, basically riot police, be via conscriptions or voluntary? 61% <clears throat> said voluntary, 39% conscriptions. Um, Serving is um, entirely via conscriptions still. So I'm gonna end this presentation now with this great quote that I feel um, uh, is something I, it's, it's a quote I like to think about before embarking on any project. Uh, Pliny the Elder said, true glory consists in doing what deserves to be written and writing what deserves to be read, um, which is something I hope um, a lot of artists um, start to think about. Uh, thanks a lot.